We can go ahead and have a seat. I want to welcome you again here to Calvary. My name is Robert. I'm the high school pastor here. Uh, I want to just uh, jump in. I'm excited to, to be continuing our guardrail series. Um, we're eight weeks into the series looking at the, the Ten Commandments and looking at, you know, what, what are the Ten Commandments that God gave the nation of Israel and what do they have to, to, to speak into our life today? And Chad gave the, the challenge early on to memorize these, and I hope that the, you at least can tag the first seven um, and you can you know, continue to add on for the next few weeks, but it started with the first commandment, to have no other gods before the one true God, to have no idols, to not take the Lord's name in vain, to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Then it went into the command to to honor your parents. And then from there, it gets really practical with with the sixth command, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not covet. And and tonight, we're we're jumping into the eighth commandment. And so uh, you can open your Bibles if you want, uh, Exodus chapter 20. It's page uh, 72 in the, the Bibles around you. Uh, it be rather short because we're looking at the, the Eighth Commandment. And the Eighth Commandment, is, there's uh, verse 15 of Exodus chapter 20. It's, it's only four words. Uh, it says, you shall not steal. That's, that's what we've got there when I was getting ready for this. When Chad said, okay, you've got, you've got the Eighth Commandment, do not steal. I really wanted to just come out here, pray, read the verse, and say, all right, guys, don't take stuff that doesn't belong to you. Fold the Bible, pray, and walk off. You guys get to the restaurant early. You beat traffic. Everything's great. But I figured that there's probably more to say than just that. So here we are. But, but when we look at this, you know, what's interesting is in the midst of, of some of these amazingly deep and in, in intentional commands from God of how we interact with him, how do we see and understand God? How do we see and understand people, you know, these other commandments? We get a command about stuff. Because all these other are, are about God, about people, how we interact. And then this is the only one that really has to do with the, the, the tangible things, the stuff in our life. And I think that's because God knows that we like stuff. And if you look around, you can, you can very easily see our, our culture's love of stuff. You know, it, when you look at the, the rise of consumerism in America over the last several decades, you can very clearly see this. You can see this in our homes, how they have grown, how they have evolved and changed over time. And you actually don't even need to go inside a, a, our homes to see this. You can see this from the street because they've gotten bigger, but this amazing thing has happened next to our homes with our garages. Because, uh, stick with me, it gets better than this. Because you go back like 60, 70 years, you don't have huge garages like we have today. Some people didn't even have carports back then. But if they did have anything, it was a covered carport, or maybe it was a garage that we would call a shed now. And then, and then it progressed a little further. The love of the automobile probably developed a little bit. We get, you know, a single car garage. And then from there, you know, it evolves, and, and it probably picked up that, hey, a lot of households have two cars, So we need a two-car garage. So boom, there we go. We expand a little bit more with the two-car garage. But then from there, we realize that, you know, a two-car garage doesn't actually fit two cars. If you have a two-car garage, you know that that probably doesn't actually fit two cars. So we need a three-car garage. Not because we actually have three cars in our household, unless you've got teenagers at home, and then cars just like multiply. They're everywhere. They're in the yard. They're in the pool. they're, They're everywhere. But you've got the three-car garage, so we can have our two cars and our stuff. You, our, our, you know, our recreational vehicles, our toys. You've got the decorations, because you've got to store the Christmas decorations and the Thanksgiving decorations and the Halloween decorations and the St. Patty's Day decorations and the Valentine's Day decorations and every other, you know, President's Day and every other holiday. We need to store the decorations as well as the clothes from your senior in high school, because you're probably going to fit in those again. The... the <laughs> The shoes that were for that one event that you definitely are going to need in the next couple of years, and also the telephone from, you know, 1985, because you're probably going to get a landline here again soon. And we store all this stuff, and so when we realize that, you need a bigger garage. And so we, as good Havasu residents, we realize that a three-car garage is kind of child's play. It's not really a garage until you put an RV garage on it. And an RV garage is really just a nice way to say you take your two-car garage and then you slap on a 20 by 60 foot warehouse to the side and you call that a garage. But as, as we all are seeing around us, and, and especially in our city here, it's, that's not even enough and we're doing double RVs and, and going on from there. And all this shows us that, that we like stuff. You know, we have uh, garages bigger than our houses because we like stuff. 
You look at uh, not just our, our residential uh, landscape with that, but in, in the industry, the, the self-storage industry was, was once laughed at just several decades ago. It wasn't a viable industry. No one would ever pay that kind of money to store stuff long term. It's now a $38 billion a year industry just to store stuff. That's because we like our stuff. We want to store it. We want to protect it. We want to preserve it. Because we know if it sits outside in the Havasu sun, it's only going to last like two and a half hours before it just vaporizes. And so here in the midst of the Ten Commandments, God is talking about, hey, how do you, how do you relate to me? How do you relate to other people? But let's pause for a second. Let's talk about stuff. Because God knows that, that we care about stuff. And so he says, let me help you understand this in a way that's healthy. So he gives us this command, you shall not steal. And again, we look at this and we say, okay, that's easy. I just don't take things that don't belong to me. And when we look at some of these commands, they're, they're very simple at the front end. Two weeks ago, we saw the command, you shall not commit murder. Again, uh, the, the, we looked at that and we said, okay, that's easy. Don't kill people, done. Don't murder someone, uh, you know, and you're done. But we saw, you know, Pastor Joe, he shared as he was going through this, that last year there were 17,000 murders in the United States. And so I kind of started thinking about that and said, okay, if there's 17,000 murders, how many cases of theft or like burglary or something like that? Six and a half million cases in the United States last year. So this command to not steal, while simple, we obviously have a challenge of, of connecting that and saying, okay, how do we actually live this out? And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand and, and say, hey, have you stolen something in the last, you know, week or year or anything like that? But I think just like all of these commands, we can look at this and understand that it's not just the outward act. Hey, did I rob a bank last Tuesday? Did I steal the car while I was on the test drive from Anderson or anything like that? But where's the heart behind it? Because I think we all have those areas where we say, you know what, I, I'm guilty of breaking the heart of this command. And maybe it is taking something that didn't belong to you. Maybe it's big, maybe it's small, maybe it's, it's that pen that you're like, hey, this writes really nice, and you just like magically walk off with it. <laughs> but maybe since we're in tax season, maybe it's, it's cheating on your taxes. And you go, oh, Robert, whew, I would never cheat on my taxes. Okay, did you fudge a little bit? Did you neglect to, to list some income there? Or, or go a little overly generous with, with one of the deductions? Maybe it has to do with your workplace. Maybe you're, you're an hourly employee and you, you milk the clock on the, the, the tail end. Or maybe you work a little slow and say, you know what, they don't pay me much, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna make up for it this way. Or maybe you look around and, and you grab some stuff as you go home and you know, some supplies or materials or something. Oh, they got plenty. They got plenty of money to buy more. They're not gonna miss it. Or maybe it's even more intangible. Maybe in the midst of conversation, you steal ideas from other people and claim them as your own. Maybe as people are congratulating someone over a success or something that happened well, you claim credit and steal that. Or maybe, maybe it is about stuff in, in the midst of a loved one's passing and, and the estate process there. There's, there's a, a process that you're involved in fighting and, and trying to claim those possessions. See, no matter where you're at in this, I think at some level we all are guilty of breaking the heart of the command. Even if we're not on the, the nightly news for robbing a bank or stealing a car or something drastic like that, I think we can all look at this and say, you know what, I've, I've mishandled stuff in my life. I, I've had those moments where I've gone too far, where I've not done the right thing with stuff. And so what we want to do tonight is say, okay, God gives us these, these four words here in Exodus chapter 20. He says, hey, do not steal. Why? Why does he give us this command? What's the heart behind it to inform how we navigate forward as we uh, seek to, to please him and honor him? And so I think there's three reasons why God gives us this command to not steal. And the first is this. It's that we were invited to trust God. Throughout scripture, we see this over and over again that God is constantly inviting us to trust him. He's constantly saying, hey, I have a plan. I'm gonna take care of you. I'm gonna provide. Will you trust me? Will you just commit in faith and trust to me? And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus connects this with our stuff, and he says this. He says, therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. 
So when we look at our life, we have to understand, hey, God is the one that has provided everything. God is our heavenly father who loves us, who wants to give us good things, who wants to provide our needs. And ultimately, scripture explains that God owns everything. Even the things that we want to claim as our own possessions are really given to us by God to manage and oversee. So it means our stuff, our car, our house, our toys, our boats, our families, our jobs, our marriages, those are all things that God has brought into our life and says, hey, I want you to manage these things. I want you to oversee them. And the implication of this is that what we have right now is what we need right now. It may not be what we want right now, but if scripture says that God gives us what we need, if God provides us our needs, it means what we have right now is what we need right now. And it may not feel that way, but, but I think many of us are guilty of, of mislabeling the things that we need. And I think that's because deep down we all have a little kid inside of us. And I don't know if you remember the days of, of getting the Christmas catalogs in the mail from J.C. Penney's and Sears and some of those. But, but what, what always happened? You get it in the mail, and, and I know I, I did this as a kid. You start to go through it and start to circle things that you want, right? And, and you get to see all the new gadgets and gizmos and toys and all these amazing things. You're like, wow, I didn't even know that existed. But what? I need that. And it's not that, that I would circle like two or three things and be like, okay, mom, here's, here's like my like top priority. If that can't work, here's a couple alternates. No, I'm like, okay, here's two dozen things circled, 25 days of Christmas. We can make this work, right? Like we just, <laughs> just spread it out over the month and we can make this happen. And all these things that 10 minutes ago I didn't know existed are now needs. And I get to see this in my, my oldest son, Eli, as is, is he sees things at a friend's house or at a store or on TV. These are things he, quote, needs. And if he can't have it, well, he's three, so you can imagine how that goes. <laughs> but see, we, we aren't all that different. We often see things that we want, that we desire. We have goals, ambitions, and stuff, and, and we label them as needs and get upset when that doesn't happen. But Scripture says this in Philippians 4.19. It says, God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Our actual needs will be provided to us by God. And, and the desire to steal is rooted in a lie that, that what we want is a need and that need isn't being provided for. And so really what we're saying is if we are, are, are tempted to, to move forward in stealing, if we are tempted to acquire things in a way that is not ethical or moral, what we're really saying is, hey, God, you have messed up. I have a need, and you're not filling it, so I'm going to have to do it for you. And we get into a really dangerous place when we start to call God wrong, when we start to, to, to call out his actions as mistakes. So know that, that God will provide every need that you have, but he wants you to trust him. He wants us to trust that he will provide, that your actual needs will be provided for, and that he has a desire to supply your wants as well if they align with, with his will, but he wants us to trust him in that. So he cares about our stuff because he wants us to trust him first off, but I think he also cares about how we see and interact with our stuff because we were created to contribute. See, as much as we love sitting around on the day off, not doing anything, just watching TV or, or binging on Netflix or whatever your do-nothing day looks like, at some level, it's dissatisfying to us. And it might feel good for a day, but if you carry that out for two or three, maybe you're down for an illness or, or you're held up with an injury, you start to feel it that, hey, this isn't what I want because we were created for something more. Each one of us were created to add value and contribute to the world around us. If you look back at, at Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve are there in the beginning, and it says that the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and to keep it. So in the very beginning there, it says God gave Adam a job to do. It says, okay, here's your job, go to work. You know, I might be thinking, yeah, it was after he messed up, that's his punishment. He, God's like, hey, you, you, you messed up, here's your shovel, get to work. This is chapter 2. The, the sin and rebellion happens in chapter 3. So before sin even enters the world, before there is the fall, before there's a rebellion against God, God says, hey, you have a job to do. Which means that work is not a punishment. Work is not a result of sin. Work is not our, like, sentence from God. But work is something that we were created to do. 
The, the work that we have has been given to us by God to contribute to the world, to make a difference, to make an impact on people, and ultimately to, to honor him in that. And so when we look at this, we have to understand that work is not just something that, that we have to do because we've got bills to pay, but, but it means that we are created for that. Which also means, by the way, that, that work will be in heaven. That, that heaven isn't just like us sitting on like a cloud, like playing a, a, a harp and just, you know, like floating around. I imagine popcorn for some reason, maybe because it's like light and airy. Like, I don't know. That's not what heaven's going to be. See, Scripture calls us servants of God, which means that when we are in the eternal presence of God, we are going to be serving him. And so even in heaven, we understand that, hey, it's not about us. Heaven is 100% about God, which means we are there to serve. And since in the perfection of Adam and Eve there in the beginning there was work, there will be work in heaven too. So what's this mean for us? It means that, that God made us to work. It means that that's part of what we were created to do and, and how we are wired. And as you look through the Bible and you look at, okay, where else does it talk about stealing? So this is the topic of the day. So what's this have to do with this? So you look at the talk of, uh, of stealing throughout the Bible. Most of the time, it just mirrors back to Exodus. It just kind of repeats that. Do not steal. You know, probably a half dozen, maybe 10 or so instances throughout the Bible just says, hey, don't steal. Don't take stuff that isn't yours. But then in the book of Ephesians, it goes a little further. Ephesians 4.28 says this. It says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone who is in need. So the command here is to stop stealing, but to go and do honest work. And, and, and this has shown that, that work fulfills what we're created to do. When we live in that, that mindset of being a thief, pulling away from others, we're going against how we were created to live. And so the correction there is, hey, stop stealing and go do honest work. And so for us, as we look at this concept of stealing, it means that, that we have to understand rightly how work is, is to be seen in our eyes. So if, if you here are, are working, if you're, you're still actively employed, that means that, that God has given you that job as a part of how you were created. And you may hate Monday mornings, and we'll get to that in a second, but we shouldn't see Monday mornings as a result of sin, but we're saying, hey, this is an opportunity for us to go live out how we were created to be. So if you, if you work, see this as an opportunity to glorify and worship God. You can do this by representing Jesus in the workplace, by representing the, the character and nature of who Jesus is and who he's called you to be. And some of you might, might be kind of smiling or chuckling on the inside because you know how jacked up your workplace is. <laughs> they need you even more then. That, that, that's even greater reason for you to represent Jesus and to, to live out the character of Christ in that place. But, but worship God with your work by representing Jesus, by being an excellent employee, by going uh, above and beyond what you are, are called to do, by being honest and truthful even when it might be to your own detriment, by serving people with joy and, and gladness, and by, by working with truthfulness and honesty in everything. And in, in all that, if you hate your job, then understand that, that God may be calling you to, to a change. It may be a change of location or vocation, or it might just be a change in attitude. He says, hey, I, I've got you here for a reason. Trust me in this. But if you're working, see that as an opportunity to worship. And if you're here and you're retired, you're not actively employed, you don't, you don't get a scapegoat on this. I'll pick on you now. Because... This, this call to contribute doesn't end when our employment ends. When we file our retirement paperwork, when we start drawing from our retirement account or Social Security, whatever that looks like for you, that's not the end of that, that call for you. It just changes it. But God has still given you time, talents, and abilities to contribute and make a difference with. And so you now have the opportunity to say, hey, I'm going to find a new way to make a difference with those time, talents, and abilities. And if you don't know what that looks like, let me challenge you to start thinking, hey, what are the, the talents and abilities I have? And are those things that, that the church could use to make a difference? Because we've got a handful of people that are retired, and, and we refer to them as volunteer staff because they basically work full-time for free, working with their talents and abilities and the extra time that they have to, to grow the kingdom of God, to make a difference in this community and around the world. 
And maybe you're here and you've got a talent and ability that you're like, man, I, I really could put this to work. We could make a difference with this. Come talk to us and let us help you find a way to do that. Maybe it's here, maybe it's in a, a, a nonprofit or something here in the community that we can partner with and, and push forward. But ultimately, let's, let's not see our work and our time as just a neutral thing that we have to get through. But let's use it as an opportunity to worship, as an opportunity to glorify and honor God with our time because we were created to contribute. Finally, God cares about this command not to steal because we were called to be generous. I love this, the, the Ephesians passage because it says, Let the thief no longer steal, but let him labor doing honest work with his hands so that he may have something to share with anyone who is in need. Notice the destination of that. It doesn't say, let the thief no longer steal so that he can build a new house. Let the thief no longer steal so he can go buy a new pickup truck. Let the thief no longer steal but work hard so he can build up a, a retirement account. No, it says, let the thief no longer steal so he can go and be generous, so he can make a difference in other people's life. And I think really where this gets down to, this, this, uh, this command not to steal, is how we see our stuff and how we live in generosity. Because this, this idea of generosity is so tied to the heart of who God is. Because if we are a follower of Jesus, that is, if we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and Savior of the world, we believe that he came and gave himself, gave his life, gave his, his suffering and death for us on the cross to forgive us of our sins, and we've decided to follow him, it means we've been the recipient of an incredible amount of grace, an incredible amount of generosity. In fact, the greatest act of generosity the world will ever know. We've been the recipients of that. And Scripture tells us that if we're going to follow Jesus, we use him as our example of how we live and what we do, which means God's saying, hey, I want you to live in generosity. Because if you are a follower of Jesus, that, that concept of generosity is what God is calling you to live out. And this is so tied to this issue of stealing because uh, generosity I I is the, the, the counteracting point to this. Let me explain what that, that looks like. Because when, when God gives us this, this call to generosity, he explains that, that we do this for a couple of reasons. First is that the generosity leads to blessing. In the Old Testament, God establishes kind of like the baseline for what generosity should look like, and it's, it's called the tithe. And, and in that, God says, hey, I, I want you to take a tenth of your income, whatever you make, and, and take 10%, and I want you to give it back to me through the church. And we believe that it's not because God needs our money. God already owns everything. It's not that the church needs our money. God will provide for whatever the church needs, but it's, it's an act of us learning to be generous. And that's kind of that starting point of saying, okay, I'm going to learn how this generosity thing works. That's, that's the process for, for establishing those habits and patterns in my life. But God also says that when we do that, he promises that he will bless us in that. In, in fact, in the book of Malachi, it, he challenges us to, to, to faithfully tithe and see if he doesn't open the floodgates of blessing in our life. Now, we can, we can be incorrect in this and say, hey, if you give $10, God's going to give you 100 we can tie that and try and create, or even if you give 10, God will give you 10 back. The blessing is not always financial, but, but we can clearly see throughout Scripture that those who are faithful to God in every way are going to be blessed by Him. And so that the act of generosity first leads to blessing, but then we also understand that, that generosity leads us to contentment. And contentment is this thing that for most of us is really elusive, that we're, we're constantly chasing, because as soon as we get to that point of contentment, our inner three-year-old comes out, and we see something shiny, and we're like, ooh, I need that. And so we're, we're constantly chasing this, this idea of contentment, but when we live in generosity, we build and, and establish that process of, of being content with where we are in life. And I think that's because when we live in generosity, we have to take kind of an inventory of our life. We say, okay, what, what do I have? What has God given me? What, what do I have at my disposal? What do I have kind of at, at access to me? But secondly, how can I use that to bless other people? Because God doesn't just bless us just so that we can enjoy it, but, but he wants to bless us so that we can bless others and so we can be a conduit of blessing to the world around us. And so God says, hey, I, I want you to use what you have to bless people, to, to live in that process of generosity. And 
when I was going through seminary, I was, I was in a, a class, and uh, I'll admit a lot of the, the, the lectures and, and things that I heard in seminary do not stick in my memory. Um, and I don't remember as much as I would have liked to out of all those classes, but I remember this one moment very clearly. We were talking about this process of generosity, and a professor I had, he, he made this, this one statement that's just echoed in my mind, and that's that generosity is the antidote to greed. That, that when we wrestle against that, that feeling, that pull, that, that, that desire to, to, to be greedy, to hoard, to collect, to acquire, whatever that looks like in your life, the way we fight against that is to be generous. And I know that this is, has rang true in my life, and I'm sure it will in yours, but, but we understand that, that giving away is the, the exact antidote we need to that, that, that pull of greed, of discontentment, that ultimately leads to theft. And so when God looks at this, he says, hey, I want you to be generous because I know that this ultimately covers everything in this category. That when we live with generosity, it it counteracts our greed, our discontentment, and, and ultimately those things that lead to us incorrectly viewing stuff in our life. So how are you at being generous? How are you at following the command to, to tithe and to trust God with your income? How are you at being generous with your time and your talents and abilities, those, those intangibles that we get to decide how they're used and where they're placed? How are you at, at being generous with your money as you see people who have needs and, and you have opportunities to meet those needs? Do you do that reluctantly or, or excitedly? How are you at being generous with your stuff? Do you allow people to borrow things, to, to utilize things, or do you, you hoard them and protect them and try and preserve them? See, God wants us to live as people who are generous because he knows that ultimately this helps us have a right view of stuff. And when we're generous, it ultimately goes back to that, that initial point of trusting God. Because if I'm giving it away, it's because I'm trusting that God will provide what I need. And today, as we look at this command not to steal, we understand it's, it's bigger than whether or not we, we rob a bank at gunpoint or we, we drive off with that car on a test drive and go, oh, I'll, just, I'll just keep this and keep on going. It's bigger than whether or not we're on the nightly news. It's about the heart of, of how we view our stuff, how we view our work, how we view God and how he will provide in our life. And so our hope and our prayer for you is that, that you would allow God to change how you view stuff, that you would trust God to provide what you need and, and provide the things of life that, that are essentials for you that you would trust God at that point, that you would view work not as a means to an end, not just the thing that you need to pay rent, but as an opportunity to trust him and worship him in that. And that both of those things would flow to a point of generosity so that you can make a difference. And as this passage in Ephesians shared, that we would work with our hands so that we may have something to share with those who are in need. God cares about this command not to steal because he wants to keep us on the path that avoids a crash in our life. He doesn't want us running into that guardrail, but it requires us trusting him and living out this call to be generous. Our hope and prayer for you is that you would walk down this journey as well. Let's pray. God, we thank you that, that your words is not just a a sledgehammer to our life, wanting to to show us how we've done wrong and how we've messed up, but God, it's it's a scalpel in the hand of a surgeon wanting to change our heart and change the direction of our life to go in a a better direction, to take a better path, to, to take a path that leads us away from crashing. And so God, as we look at this passage tonight, I pray that you would just let it soak into our life illuminate the, the areas of our, our hearts where we have, have run from you. We've, uh, we've gone against this command not to steal. And God, help us to, to see this as an opportunity to change, not just a, a, a call to rebuke us and, and call us out for our sins, but to call us to a new life, a life of trusting you, of, of seeing work as a way to, to worship you and, and a way to, to live generous with our life. God, we're thankful for how you've been generous to us, how you have poured out your love and your grace and mercy into our life. And we just pray that, that we would be a, a good mirror to that, to the world around us, that we would pour out generosity and forgiveness and grace as we have needs around us. 
God, we love you. We just ask that you help us to love and follow you better. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.